for it. Yes, you asked for it. Television's greatest all-time request show. Brought to you by Skippy, America's largest selling peanut butter. If you like peanuts, you like Skippy. You asked for it. With your genie with the light white hair, Art Baker. Thank you, my friends, and welcome to You Ask For It. This is the show, you know, where you write in and uh, ask for something that you possibly might never see on any other television show. And uh, we want you to ask for the unusual. We dare you and we challenge you. But you've been quite terrific, believe me. Some of your letters really hit the bell. Now, let me recap a little bit. We had a flea circus. Uh, we gave you little Shirley Temple at three years of age. We had a hooded cobra. We gave you a million dollars to look at. And again tonight, we will have for a television first one a very amazing performance, all because of this first request that came in here. And that is from Fred McGoffin of Providence, Rhode Island. That's Fred's picture up there now. It sounds very simple, but believe me, listen to it. Dear Art Baker, we are wrestling fans, but we would like to see some new faces. We read about a wrestling chimpanzee in the papers, so he is what we are asking for. Sincerely, Fred McGoffin. Very well, Mr. McGoffin. Presenting in the black corner at 125 pounds, with a strength six times that of a man. We have the only wrestling chimpanzee in the world, Gorgeous Joe. <laughs> and in the white corner at 190 pounds, his opponent, Melvin Kuntz. <laughs> Come here, hurry, Duke. Come on, what are you doing? Here, come right inside here. Come on, hurry up, come on, let's go. Hurry up, come on, get your Dukes up there and last a little bit, boy, before I tell you. Face this. Ah! Don't, don't fast stop on them like this. Who do you think you are, You get a hold on me and I'll get a hold on you, Don, and we'll do it this way. <laughs> McGoffin, you asked for some new faces. I hope you're satisfied with Melvin Kuntz and Gorgeous Joe. Thank you very much because you asked for it. You know, my friends, all the way from Portland, Oregon, way back to Portland, Maine, this sort of thing goes on all the time in grocery stores, yeah? The grocery clerk goes to a lot of work building a great, big, beautiful display of Skippy peanut butter. And what happens? Well, 
housewives and shoppers come in, and they take a jar off here and a jar off there. And before long, the grocery clerk has to get busy and build up the display all over again. <laughs> but uh, even though he goes home kind of weary and tired at night, you think he cares about that? Mm-mm. No. I can't think of anyone, well, unless it might be my sponsor and uh, maybe myself, who gets happier over selling a jar of Skippy peanut butter than, uh, than a grocery clerk. Uh, you see, there's a reason for that, and I'd like to tell you, tell you why. What a grocery clerk does not like is when uh, a customer returns and comes back and goes yakety-yacking about something that uh, uh, she didn't like. And that never happens with Skippy. No. You see, Skippy is the only peanut butter in the entire store that has had the stale makers removed. And that, of course, means that every jar of Skippy peanut butter, there is never any staleness or rancid taste, or it's, uh, it's always easy to digest. Now, uh, that is why, of course, your grocery clerk likes a thing like that. Uh, Skippy is the one peanut butter of America's greatest selling peanut butter. And, of course, there's a reason for it. Now, I would end this by saying that a pleased customer makes a grocery clerk happy. So what? Well, I'll tell you what, Skippy is very pleasant indeed. I'd love to have you try it and see, hmm? Mighty glad to get this, you don't mind my apron on here, one of this, uh, another request. This is from uh, Janice Mail of San Diego. And she says, Dear Art Baker, I'm one of the legions of Boogie Woogie fans who think that Ivory Joe Hunter, the happiest man alive, is one of the greatest jive artists they have ever heard. And last year, over one million of his records were sold. He has just finished an engagement at the Club Oasis in Los Angeles, and he is even greater than the critics say. Sincerely, Janice Mayle. All right, Janice Mayle, I'm glad you asked for this, and we are privileged now to give the Coast to Coast television debut of Ivory Joe Hunter. First time some boogie also fed his life, but this is the boogie no every mama like his all state boogie. His all state boogie. What I like about the boogie is good in all 48. I like the boogie in the north, the boogie in the south. I heard my saw cat boogie with the mouse by the all state boogie. By the all state boogie. They kept on boogie until the bulldog came along. What a boogie. Away your shoes and oh shine away your blue and shine everything, make it look like new. All the folks will have you wear a smile at you, oh shine, you these and know this. Everything will turn out fine. Folks will shine up to you, but it's gonna have to do you. Make the whole world do 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 shine and turn it. Did you? That is a card charm, a card cheat at work. And my friends, $600 million were built from the pockets of Americans in a year by these card shops. 
Now, one of the victims happened to write in a request. He is Jim Honan of Dallas, Texas. That's Jim's picture of there. He says, Dear Art Baker, there is a sucker born every minute, and I guess I was one of them until I learned that card sharps turn up in every club, army barrack, or parlor car just waiting for a chance to take us. I would appreciate seeing some of their tricks exposed on your show. Thank you, Jim Honan. All right, Jim Honan, you ask for it. And we are very fortunate in granting your request tonight because for a television first, we have with us tonight to expose these card connivers, the vice president of the Society of Magicians of America, Mr. Robert Haskell. I want to tell you that we're very happy to see a crusader like you who is out uh, after these conniving gamblers, believe me. Thank you, Art. The uh, only way I can help honest card players is to be dishonest myself. That's kind of sad, isn't it? There. I see what you mean, though. Yeah. Say, I'm going to start right off. Here's something I know I could never get. But I've scared to death of a marked deck. Can you tell me anything about that? Art, I just happen to have a marked deck with me, and mm -hmm. I'd like to explain it to you. Uh, markings are usually in the corner or around the edges. Mm -hmm. This one happens to be a corner mark. Now just picture this circular design here as the face of a clock. Mm -hmm. There are 12 dots here and each dot represents the hour of the clock. Yeah. 11 of the dots are black, one of them is white. Now assuming this is a clock, at what hour would the white spot be? There's a one, an ace, huh? Then this would be an ace. Uh -huh. How about this one? Well, that's uh, seven. That's a seven. Right. And right on through the deck. Uh -huh. Now, I'm going to show you a trick of uh, how to detect marked cards. First of all, the cards are marked in both corners, so that mm -hmm. no matter which way the deck is turned, you mm -hmm. can read them. Mm -hmm. I want you to keep your eye on that corner, and I'm going to riffle the deck and watch that white mark jump around. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. See it go? I'll yeah. do it again for yeah. you so you can see it. See, there is and that's something. how you could detect uh, most marked decks. You mean if you riffle them and something jumps around like crazy, that ain't right, huh? That's right, Art. See, that's something. Now, you got some other elaborate devices that I would never suspect, but I'd like <laughs> well, to show. Well, I was about to use this on the next hand, Art. It's uh, what is called a spy. It's uh, sort of a looking glass. It's a mirror, which is laid on the table. And as the dealer deals out cards, he glimpses them, and he knows what cards his opponents have. That's mm. quite an advantage. Well, he kn yeah, he knows their hands. That's right. Looking, right. Looking, uh -huh. And uh, right on this line, I have something that's rather unique. <laughs> uh, this was originated by a very old-time gambler. His name was Taylor, and this is his gun. Mm. Uh, when he'd start to play, he'd uh, put the gun on the table and say, listen, we want to have a nice, honest game here, mm. and this will see that we do. But the back end was very highly polished, uh -huh. and that uh -huh. served as the mirror. He did all the cheating with the gun on the table. Well, how do you like that? Got a mirror right on the gun there. Say, that's something. That's, that's elaborate. I know I'd never detect that. Now, there, there's some of the... You, you've got your cards with you here. Show us some of the tricks of these sharks, will you? I'll be glad to, Art. You see, there are a thousand ways that a dishonest card player can take advantage of his fellow man. i like to show you a few of them. If you remember the hand that won just a few moments ago, it won with four aces. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to show you how I got those four aces and where they came from. They were at the bottom of the deck. I'm going to deal out the four hands. And every time I give myself a card, it's going to come off the bottom. And I'm going to deal the four aces from the bottom. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, and the fourth one, they're no longer here. In order that you can watch the four aces, I'm going to place them face up on the bottom. Now watch again. One, two, three, an ace. Uh -huh. One, two, three, an ace. One, two, three. Now here's what happens. The top card is pushed off. At the same time, the bottom card is pushed out. The top card acts as the cover. The bottom one continues out, becomes mine. Uh -huh. And to get that last one, here we have the four aces. Aside from the fact that uh, you manipulate the cards, you have to also develop a, what they call a photographic mind. 
look at the cars the way I'm looking at them and memorize, well, the whole deck. I like to demonstrate that to you. All right, I would like you to touch one card as I pass them from hand to hand. All right, we're going to place the card down and I'm going to find out what it is in this manner. I riffle the deck, look at the faces, and I see which one is missing. Yeah. So I know what card you have. Now I'm going to locate the other three by cutting, one at a time. One, we turn over the top card, and it's a six. So we know that your card was also a six. I remember where the second one was. And I cut that one to the top. A second six. Now bear in mind, Art, that I'm only trying to match your card with three others. Mm -hmm. And if I'm lucky, and you do have to be a bit lucky, I'm going to have the third six. And here it is. Mm. Remember, Art, we're going to get four of a kind, so here's your... Yeah, made a mistake there, huh? Well, no, the idea is to produce four of a kind. It doesn't matter if they're four sixes or four jacks. Ah. <laughs> Well, now that we've now, had the college... I, I've got something else. I'm going to show you what we call the uh, the jackpot game. Oh, now, yeah. While I'm talking to you, you see I'm also looking through the cards, and I'm going to stack them. Uh, I found some, I know where they are, and I'm going to deal them into position for playing a hand. And uh, I want you to watch this hand. One, two, three, four. My hand is up here. Now, I'm going to deal from the bottom and deal seconds, but I'm going to do it a little faster. And I want you to watch. I'm going to give each man a pretty good hand, a hand that he's going to stay in with and uh, perhaps make some bets. And the last one. I'm going to call the hand. The first man should have, oh, two pair, kings and queens. Kings and queens. The second hand, oh, four flush and hearts. Here we have a four flush and hearts. Number three, oh, four deuces. And here we have four deuces for number three. The fourth man, just a pair of jacks. Uh, but he plays to make the game interesting. Number one is going to discard one card and uh, draw one. Fills the full house. Uh -huh. Number two discards one, draws one. Fills the heart flush. Number three discards one, draws one. Of course, he can improve his hand. Number four discards three and draws one, two, three aces. Mm -hmm. You could well imagine that if every hand bets according to the value of their cards, there's going to be a lot of money in the pot. I want to win that one. So I discard, or oh, I'll discard this one without even looking. And I'll draw one. And uh, it's an ace. And a king. And a queen. <laughs> a jack. And I fill a royal straight flush. In the state. Well, let me see. Now that we know everything there is to know... Uh... All right, now let me stop you there. Uh, just because I've showed you how to do a few things doesn't mean that you can detect it. Because believe me, you can't. But there's one recommendation I would like to make. Don't play cards for money with strangers. Now, I don't mean to imply that all strangers are dishonest or are crooks. But all crooks are strangers. I like that very much indeed, believe me. And uh, I can't tell you how we appreciate the very magnificent way that you uh, kind of showed up these connivers here. We're very greatly indebted to you, and as vice president of the uh, Associ uh, Association of Magicians, isn't it? Of America, the Society of That's Magicians. Right. We feel very honored in having you here, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Thank you. And uh, to letter writer uh, Jim Honan of Dallas, who had some tough luck before, I can only say that I hope you have better luck in the future and that you learn something tonight. And we're very glad that you asked for it. Uh, which reminds me that nothing happens on this show until you ask for it, of course. And we give it kind of a challenge. Ask for the unusual. That's our job here, and we love it very much. And so put on your thinking cap, and here's our address. Please jot it down. You asked for it. Box 323, Hollywood 28, California. And thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, because you asked for it, in a moment, you will see a man look death straight in the eye. Let me read this request. It's very short. This is from Ralph Johnson of Dallas. Very short, but very potent. It says, Dear Art Baker, you have dared us to dare you, so I am asking to see an apple shot off a person's head just as William Tell did it. Sincerely, Ralph Johnson. All right, Mr. Johnson, you ask for it. I want you to meet the archery champion of America, a modern William Tell, Mr. Stan Overby. Mr. Overby is the only archer who dared do this very, very uh, dangerous trick. That is not a trick at all, this feat, under the glaring lights of a television studio. And over there, in the other part of the woods, is a young man who is gambling his safety on the skill of this young archer. Now, he is, happens to be Mr. Uh, he is Mr. Chalman, who is a business associate and the best friend of Stan Overby. But he realizes that the missing by one inch, he realized what it could mean. It could mean death. And so, this is an amazing thing. I'd like you to know right here that we have no tricks at all up our sleeve. Exactly what happens, you will see. Uh, there are no camera angles of any kind. May I borrow this a moment? Mm -hmm. These are steel tipped. With their amazing speed and velocity, they would go entirely through the body of a large deer if uh, Stan were uh, hunting deer. All right, sir. Mr. Chalman, are you ready? Stan Overby, are you ready? Letter writer Ralph Johnson of Dallas, are you ready? Remember, you asked for it. to you, but I'm very glad to remove this from my right-hand pocket as ungranted to the left-hand pocket, which is granted, believe me. There you have seen an amazing combination of confidence and skill. Confidence on the part of Bob Chalman in the skill of that steel-nerved young man, Stan Overby, who was America's uh, champion archer. I'm very glad also that you asked for this. It was an amazing feat, bringing back that greatest of all historical events, the William Tell Apple. Thank you, because you asked for it. Believe it or not, my friends, you are now peering at peanuts. Peanuts in their most delicious, most digestible, and most convenient form. Naturally, that means you're now gazing at Skippy. Skippy peanut butter, but let me tell you something. Feasting your eyes on Skippy, as you're now doing, is all well and good. But feasting your taster is at least 187% more fun. That's a conservative estimate, too. For do you know what Skippy tastes like? Peanuts! That's right, absolutely. Skippy does not taste like peanut butter, but it tastes precisely, exactly like plump, selected, fresh roasted peanuts. And the peanuts that go into Skippy are the only peanuts in the whole wide world that have the stale makers removed so that Skippy can be the peanut butter that stays sweet and fresh and easily spread down to the last spoonful. Now, in case you might think I'm exaggerating, well, okay. I dare you to go out tomorrow and bring back a jar of Skippy because this is an honest fact. If you like peanuts, you'll like Skippy. <laughs> You, uh, you may know who was asked for in this next request. Allow me to read it for you, please. This is from uh, Mr. George Conway of Washington, D.C., and it says, Dear Art Baker, I knew Al Jolson for a good many years. You see, I grew up with the Jolson brothers, Harry and Al, in Washington, D.C., 
and followed their careers on the stage ever since. Harry as a vaudeville headliner until he retired, and Al as the greatest of all musical comedy stars. Yes, Al is gone now, but I've heard that my old friend Harry is living on the West Coast. I am asking to see and hear Harry Jolson again, for old times' sake. Sincerely, George Conway. All right, Mr. Conway, you ask for it. Here is Harry Jolson. Mr. Harry Jolson, I want to tell you that this is very thrilling for you to come out of retirement at 70 and you haven't been on the stage for many years now. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't do it for anybody else. I, 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 I'm tired. Yeah, I can know you. Mighty tired. Well, I'll tell you, Harry, uh, you are really a part of the Jolson family and the Jolson story, but uh, in that picture, I didn't see you. You didn't see me that picture Jolson story? No. I was there. <laughs> You remember, you remember uh, three of us, you know, I mean the three, uh, mother and father and Al sitting there eating. In the dining room, yeah. Yeah, in the dining room, didn't you see me? No, where were you? I was in the kitchen washing the dishes. I can see. Listen, Harry, I know that you haven't sung for a long time, but uh, are you going to sing a, a, a mammy song like Listen, that? Listen, don't try and ask me to give me an imitation of my brother. There was nobody in this world could imitate my brother. That's right. He I was know. the greatest singer in the world. But Harry, I know you, you've been retired a long time, but won't you give us something? Well, I'll try. I'll try my best for old time's sake to sing a Jolson song. Good, good. <laughs> you made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You made me want you. And all the time you do it. And all the time you do it. You made me happy sometimes. You made me glad. For there were times, dear, uh, you made me feel so bad. You made me sigh, oh, I didn't want to tell ya, I didn't want to tell ya. I want some love, that's true, yes I do, you know I do. Give me, give me what I sigh for, you know you got the friend of kisses that I die for. You know you made me. Of you. 